Soon I came at the place of appointment, where I waited for further orders. After one week I was ordered to replace an ambulance attendant in the front lines deep in Russia. Until now I had no real conception of what war really means, and my heart was filled with fear and sadness, though outwardly I tried to be courageous, and nobody saw I was frightened of the coming days. Fourteen days took us to our destination, and they were fourteen days and fourteen nights of sorrow and fear. I was to be an ambulance attendant, a human being going into war to help others, going where people were killing each other. I often wondered whether this was kindness or cruelty. My mind, wandering back to childhood, could not help but reflect how wonderful life had been during my school days, with all my friends about me, and with the love and companionship of my parents and sister. Who could say what life would be like after this terrible, nonsensical war? I didn't know it, but I was now embarking on the cruelest period of my life. On the night of the fourteenth day, we came to our destination, perhaps ten miles behind our lines. As soon as the train stopped, we had to get off at once. The Russians had learned about this transport and were firing upon it with long-range cannons. It was a harrowing experience. Under the cannonade, we marched to our unit, a seemingly endless march. The entire horizon seemed to be aflame, the projectiles falling and exploding about us. The road was covered with dead horses, soldiers and burning wagons and cars. We stumbled along, not knowing which one of us would be hit next. At dawn the next day I came to my unit, where I was to replace the ambulance attendant they had lost. My superior officer told me that we were now in the second line of fire, but that tomorrow we would have to relieve the front line and some casualties were expected. The relief was planned for noontime. Between dawn and noon of that day I kept silent, talking with my soul and praying to God to keep me strong and calm, also asking blessings for my parents. The hands of the clock kept moving, the strain on our nerves growing with each second. We all felt this, smoking one cigarette after another, waiting for the signal to relieve the front line. The order to form a line-up came like a fanfare, everyone putting out his cigarette, pulling on his helmet and getting ready to move. We had to cross an open field, though the Russian soldiers were on the other side upon a hill where they had a very good view of us, firing upon us as soon as we started to come out of our dugout. My job began right now. Everywhere there was somebody hit who was crying for help. I wanted to cry when I came to my first wounded soldier. One of his legs was torn off at the trunk. I knelt down and tried with shaking hands to give him first aid, put him in my tent cloth and dragged him back to the medical tent. All around us the bombs and grenades shook the ground, but I made it to the tent with my wounded fellow man. I was pale and scared when at last we reached safety. After a short prayer I went again to fulfil my mission. Late in the afternoon, crawling and running, we had reached the front line, but the loss of soldiers was enormous. During the next few weeks we didn't leave our trench, for the Russians fought for every inch of ground they lost, many thousands of bullets and grenades being exchanged between both armies. We lost many soldiers, but replacements came every week. This position was held for almost four weeks. Then the order came from army headquarters to take the position from the enemy. The attack was set for 4 a.m. the next day. Stukas and fighter planes came howling nearer, and at precisely 4 a.m. the bombs exploded in the Russian line. It sounded as if the earth were bursting. This offensive took the Russians by surprise, the survivors drawing back several miles. As soon as we had taken possession of their trenches, we found that we had been fighting against women, for there were few men among the dead. After this battle we advanced for perhaps one hundred miles without making contact with the enemy. It did not seem to occur to our leaders that the Russians were leading us into a trap. They let us penetrate deep into Russian territory, since the next Russian line was behind the River Don. We built our trench on the west side, facing the Russian soldiers on the east. Here, too, there were daily exchanges of bullets across the river. The Russian army leaders knew the winter time to be their best ally, whereas the German leaders seemed to have learned nothing from the previous winter. The River Don, running from north to south as far as Stalingrad, was the natural defence line for the Russians. 
It was a severe test for our army, a nerve-wracking encounter which may have been the turning point in World War II. My unit had to reinforce the efforts of the 6th Army in and around Stalingrad, which had been the scene of violent action since November and would presumably soon be encircled. It was our job to keep open the northwest side for reinforcements and to bring out the sick and wounded. We moved as fast as was possible in the bitter cold and deep snow. In the first days of December, we came to Kalach, the last town before Stalingrad, and virtually a suburb of that city, where we had to fight for every inch of our advance. We kept fighting for the next fourteen days, not knowing that it was we ourselves who were encircled. This circle in Stalingrad was a hell on earth, each house a battlefield. It was here that my luck ran out, though I didn't know at the time which would be better to be dead or taken prisoner of war. On Sunday morning, December 20, I was captured by some Russian soldiers, though the Red Cross band around my left arm was clearly visible. To be a prisoner of war, especially in the most violent battle of that war, seemed to be ill fortune almost beyond enduring. I felt that I would be better off dead. As soon as the soldiers had taken our private property, rings, watches, warm clothes and boots, they brought us back to the commander, who was a commissar of the NKVD. He was quartered in an old shack. It was here that my mistreatment began. As soon as he saw me, he took up his whip and beat my face till it bled. I was, of course, an intruder on his soil, but I was also a prisoner of war without weapons, besides being an ambulance attendant entitled to protection under the rules of the Geneva Convention. Such cruelty seemed unbelievable in the 20th century, but it was only a foretaste of what was to come. I wished with all my heart that I could die. We were kept in this shack until all fifteen prisoners had made their statements about name, rank and unit. In the meantime, one prisoner asked to go to the toilet, one guard accompanying him. They were scarcely out of sight when we heard a shot, and the guard came back alone. In my heart I envied the dead man, for there was no way of knowing what would happen to us. We were asked questions about the strength of our unit, but since we were cut off from our unit, we were unable to answer, and even if we had known, we would not have told them. After this interrogation, we were forced to march about ten miles, and from that point on we had to shovel snow to clear the road so the cars could pass and bring food and reinforcements to Stalingrad. It was bitterly cold, and we were made to work from dawn till late at night. The guards brought our food along, which consisted of two pieces of table sugar, one half salt herring, and one piece of dry black bread, the daily ration for each man. There was nothing to drink, so we ate snow. At night, when the moon was shining, the guards came and drove us back in our shelter, a two-room house, unoccupied now in Watame, which was located on the outskirts of a small village. The former inhabitants of this house had taken the windows, furniture and everything movable. It was cold and draughty, the wind blowing snow in the open windows as we sat on the floor close to one another to keep warm, shivering and freezing, and waiting for the next morning when we would go again out in the desert of snow. The guards came very early in the morning when it was still dark, and we had to report the number of our crew before we received our breakfast, which consisted of one cup of hot water and one slice of dry black rye bread, suchari. After breakfast we were counted again before being sent out in the bitter cold. In this manner fourteen days passed. Each one of us came down with some form of sickness, several beginning to swell in the face and legs, others suffering the first symptoms of pneumonia. Backache was a common ailment. I told the guard that we needed a doctor, but he didn't understand what I was talking about. Some days later I became sick and couldn't go to work any more. I was burning with fever. When it became apparent to the guard that we were little more than walking corpses, he promised to call a doctor. He let us stay in our shelter till the doctor came and examined us. The doctor, seeing at first glance that there was nothing he could do, granted permission to bring all fifteen men into a hospital. We were all sick and burning with fever, but we had to wait till a truck came. We had no appetite for food, but we craved water. The truck came the next day. 
Two guards helped us to board the truck, giving us two loaves of bread and some sugar for all of us. Then we started to drive across country. We didn't know in what direction we were travelling, but we heard the artillery fire from the front, or thought we did, though sometimes it seemed that our minds were already suffering from delusion. Two days later, the truck stopped at a train station, and we were transferred to the freight wagon of a train. After two days of riding on the train, we came to the town of Volsk, located south of Gorky, which was our destination. As soon as we appeared marching in the streets, the people of this town threw stones and everything they could find at us, swearing hysterically and spitting at us, calling us fascists and imperialists. I understood the source of this hatred, for we were intruders on Russian soil, but we were now prisoners of war, without weapons, sick and in need of understanding, and it seemed odd to me that they did not realise that few of us would have gone voluntarily to war, especially against Russia. Soon we arrived at the hospital, a big stone house, formerly a school, but now, in wartime, housing the wounded and sick prisoners. As we reached the entrance, we found the air so full of stench and decay that we could scarcely breathe. Brutish sounds came from within, and I knew that inside was a human being at his last breath. Lord God, bless us and keep us, I thought, little realising that I was on the threshold of my most horrible experience in life. We entered the so-called office, where we were registered and compelled to take off all our clothing and put it in bags. These would be given back to us when we were healthy again. We were provided with a pair of drawers, a shirt, a blanket and slippers, and, thus thinly clothed, sent to the bathhouse, some fifty yards away in the backyard, to take a bath. On the way to the bathhouse, two of the fifteen collapsed and died, their hearts unable to endure this sudden change of temperature. We were given a bowl with hardly one gallon of water in it for our bath. Then we marched back to the main building to find a bed. What I had seen in the first hour was enough to convince me that we would be fortunate if any of us survived this ordeal. Pitiful specimens of humanity, walking human bodies like skeletons, their heads bald, their eyes sunken, walking with hands on the wall to support themselves, were crying for help, praying for redemption. The room in which I was placed was the isolation room, filled with those patients who were deathly ill. Here two bedsteads were put together, with boards across them on which five men could lie. I had to lie between four men who were sick with dysentery and typhus. We had only two pillows and one blanket for the five of us. Besides this bed there were five others. A bucket in one corner served as a chamber pot, but few of these men were well enough to reach the chamber pot in time, relieving themselves on the floor or wherever they happened to be. The stench was terrible, not only in this room but in all parts of the hospital, for the only lavatory was in the basement. We had no towels or anything with which to clean our hands. In the morning, when the first nurse came on duty, she asked, How many are dead? After we gave her the number, she asked, What? No more. The deed bodies were taken out of the beds, undressed, and taken away. The same woman who had done the undressing brought out breed. We could not eat, putting the bread under our pillows against the time when we would be hungry, though many times the bread was taken away from us. In this way the disease spread from one room to another, and the entire house was soon an island of dying souls. When I entered this hospital, the number of occupants had been close to three thousand, all the rooms being crowded to the fullest capacity. The mortality rate in the months from January to August was exactly 80%. During my first 14 days I was sick with typhus and had an average temperature of 102 degrees. I couldn't eat a bite, but I badly wanted something to drink. Every morning my nearest neighbour in the bed was dead. Often I envied these dead men, but when I saw how a dead body was treated, how they grasped it by the feet and dragged it out of the bed, the head striking the floor, my will to live was rekindled, and I hoped and prayed that I would get well and be permitted to leave this terrible house. Most of the prisoners had typhus exanthematus, a deadly disease which requires special care, but here there was a shortage of doctors and drugs. I do not believe that anyone made a serious effort to save or cure a prisoner. The registration of the dead prisoners was simple. 
the nurse writing the name of the deceased on a strip of newspaper with a pencil and fastening this on the wrist with a cord or bandage. Nobody knows where these creatures are buried. In the latter part of January, my temperature dropped to normal, but my body was as emaciated as the others, my weight having dropped to 96 pounds. My strength had deserted me, and I was walking like all the others, keeping my hands on the wall for support. It took me almost four more weeks to be able to walk alone without any support. Since I was a medical student, I was compelled to work in this hospital, and I was appalled at the manner in which the ill and wounded were treated. No care was exercised for the wounded, the bandages being taken off, laundered, and, after drying, put on again without being sterilised. All of the injured soldiers had worms in their wounds. It was shocking to witness their suffering. Besides those who were wounded, there were many hundreds with frostbitten hands and feet, most of them frozen in the third degree, which means that the frozen part of the hand or foot had already turned black. Though I barely had the strength to hold myself upright, I tried to help these men as best I could. During the afternoon hours I went through all the rooms to see if I could help someone. I had no drugs or medical help, but I had the knowledge and ability to make a diagnosis and could suggest what should be done and give the order to the nurse. Starvation, shortage of drugs and carelessness accounted for many deaths. I was in this hospital almost eight months, sickened by the incredible disregard for the welfare of human beings. A commission was expected to arrive from Moscow to inspect the hospital, so a house cleaning was arranged, some women from out of town brought in to wash the windows. We had to scrub the floors ourselves. The nurses made some tablecloths from cotton, and for the first time they gave us sheets and pillowcases. The commission went through all the rooms except the isolation room. The convalescent prisoners were outside in the garden, taking a sunbath and waiting for the commission. Our instructions were to tell them how grateful we were for being helped in our sickness. Nobody expected the commission to ask why so many prisoners had died and none of the others had the courage to answer. I, being a member of the Red Cross, felt a certain compulsion to answer this question, and I told them everything I had seen in the eight months I had been there, concluding with the statement that, if I were ever granted my freedom, I would tell the Red Cross how the USSR treated the members of the Red Cross and sick human beings. After the commission left, I was declared healthy enough to go to work in a labour camp which was connected with a cement factory. My weight was still 96 pounds and my strength seemed to have left me utterly. I had never known that a human being could endure such misery and I hoped and prayed to stay alive and to return to my parents and sister. Here in my lonely captivity deep in Russia, behind well-guarded fences, I realised for the first time how much I loved and missed my family. Often I thought of the bake shop, wishing that I could eat all the leftovers and the flour which was spilled on the floor. Hunger makes animals of human beings, and the Russians took advantage of this knowledge by offering us two ounces more of bread each day, for which we would work doubly hard. The work in this cement factory was manual, since the factory itself had been established almost fifty years earlier, using old-fashioned methods and manned by political or criminal prisoners, before we prisoners of war came. At the railroad station, where the cement came in freight wagons, I had to unload the cement, shovel fifty pounds in paper bags, and carry it on my back into a storeroom. We were dusty from head to toe, the dust so thick in our ears and nose when the wind was blowing that we could scarcely breathe, but it was necessary to unload the wagon if we wanted to get our extra two ounces of bread that evening. Returning to the barracks at night, we seldom found water to clean our faces and hands which contributed to our low spirits by forcing us to go about dusty and pale, looking like walking corpses. Counting the days and hoping for the end of the war was all that kept us going. It was now 1943, and none of us could or would believe that we would be here for several more years. In this factory, a Jewish woman doctor was in charge of the prisoners. This doctor knew that I was suffering from poor health and found time to talk to me as I came in the ambulance for treatment, questioning me about my descent, my education, and my family. I knew that I had found a friend, and she promised to help me, 
but she told me that she could do no more than was possible for her as a Russian citizen. I understood her position very well and didn't ask for anything that could get her in trouble. She told me that she would grant permission for the most seriously ill prisoners to transfer to another camp. When we reported to the ambulance for physical examination, several days later, I praised the Lord when I found that I was among the twenty-five sick men to be transferred, and my gratitude to this doctor was unbounded. Still, there was no way of knowing whether the new camp would be better or worse. We had hoped before to leave the worse for a better, but each time our hopes had been dashed and we had found ourselves in a worse environment than that which we had left. I was one of fifty eventually transferred to Sustal, a small town with a monastery several hundred years old. Its beautiful architecture was in evidence, but since the revolution it had become dilapidated, uncared for by the present custodians, the buildings now housing the officers of the captured army. This camp was what was called a transit camp. The NKVD, or state police, checked the records of each prisoner from the day he had been captured. If contradictory statements were issued or doubtful information given, those persons were questioned again and again. I found in this camp higher officers with some scientific background. One of them was the world-famed discoverer of Targasin, and was questioned many times a day before finally being transferred to an unknown location. It was bitterly cold, with much snow on the ground, when we left Sustal, our destination unknown. The train was headed east. None of us knew what fate had in store for us, though we were still hoping to find a place where conditions would be a little better and where we could perhaps stay until the end of the war, at which time we hoped to be permitted to go home to our families. Home seemed more real to me than during the time I had actually been there. How I would love my family, keep my parents and help them in their old age. I would do everything if only I could find them alive. My thoughts were interrupted as the train stopped and we were forced to get off. It was night time, and as soon as we left the train we were counted by the guards, then told the bad news. Our destination was Yelabuga, almost thirty miles distant, and we would have to march. It was near to forty degrees below zero, with five feet of snow. We were hungry and thirsty, and so tired that we could have fallen down and slept. Many of us collapsed, getting up and moving again after a short rest on the ground, and some could not get up at all. We tried very hard to bring each one to his feet again, taking hold of his arm and carrying him so that we would not lose anybody. During the last few miles of our march, we saw houses on the horizon, only to find that they were mirages of our exhausted minds. Three miles from Yelabuga, I collapsed and felt myself powerless to rise. It was an odd feeling, strangely comfortable, and I wished very much to die. Death due to exposure to cold would appear to be easy to endure. The commandant of Camp Yelabuga knew we were coming and had sent a sleigh to bring the most helpless. I was put in the sleigh along with several others, and after an hour's ride we arrived at Camp Yelabuga. As soon as the sleigh arrived at camp, the doctor came to see us. They gave us hot tea and a slice of bread, but I was unable to eat or drink, and the doctor, who was a woman, paid more attention to me. She realised immediately that I was in serious condition and gave me an injection. My surroundings were obliterated as I lay in a pool of darkness and rest. In my drugged state of mind, I thought I saw my mother and sister and talked with them. My heart and soul were always at home. After a few days I found myself back again in a so-called isolation room. It took me almost three weeks to get on my feet, but I had to stay in the sick room four more weeks. Upon my release from the sick room, I realised my new place of confinement was not a bit better than the places where I had previously been held captive. Camp Yelabuga had been the residence of some priests in the era of the Khazars. Here too the beautiful buildings were in a state of decay. The church was used as a storage house for food and empty boxes, the main building housing more of the prisoners. Plank beds had been built in the rooms, each person having a space of about 35 inches. Fifteen hundred men were in this camp, sixty being confined in one room. In January 1944, the commandant of this camp issued a bulletin to the effect that the camp had to manage itself. 
This meant that we had to carry our own wood for the bake shop, kitchen, laundry, etc., keep the water pumps in working condition, man the electric station, and provide all necessities for our daily life. Under the supervision of a captured German officer, who was called the camp leader, different labour groups were set up, some working in the kitchen, others in the bake shop, in the laundry, on the water pumps, electric station and ambulance. All of these groups found the work difficult, but the hardest work was carrying the wood for the entire camp. Early in the morning this group marched out, coming back at night with the wagon loaded with wood. They had to pull the wagon themselves since no horses were provided, and in winter time slides were used in place of the wagon. For this work in the wood brigade the men got four ounces more of bread and a thicker soup, extra food coming from the rations of the other men, rather than from an increase in food delivered to the camp. The result was that the soup for the rest of us was much more watery than it had been. All of us tried very hard to go only once with the wood brigade, in order that the thicker soup might be evenly apportioned among us all. The strain to our bodies meant nothing to us. It was important only that we fill up once in a while. In the meantime, America had made an agreement with Russia to help the Russian population and the prisoners of war. When the provisions of this pact began to be carried out, we felt a little more secure, more drugs were available, and the mortality rate dropped, due in part to the fact that the prisoners were becoming better adjusted to this kind of life. The daily ration was still the same, but at least we could count on getting it, which had not always been the case heretofore. Each prisoner was given a daily minimum of 600 grams of dark rye bread, which contained 60% water, 10 grams of flour or peas or potatoes, 10 grams of oil or fish, and 10 grams of sugar. In comparison, one ounce is equivalent to 28 grams. I had been in Russia almost three years, but it was still only 1944, and every day and month seemed an eternity. Most nerve-wracking of all, we had to listen to the news over the radio. The political commissar turned on the radio so that we could hear how the Russian army was repelling the German army, and that Germany would soon be the battlefield. We still had hopes that the war would be over soon, and that we could go home. In December 1944, German towns were mentioned for the first time in the news, and we sat listening while our hopes of ever seeing our relatives again died within us. We were still thousands of miles away from home in 1945, and the Russian army was in Germany, with thousands of people fleeing from East Prussia while we remained captive in Russia, starving and waiting to return to our homes. Our thoughts on New Year's Eve 1944 were of home, and we were praying and hoping for a happy 1945. In February 1945, the name of my hometown was mentioned in the news. The town, according to the newscast, was virtually razed after a fierce battle. I sat on my bed and cried, feeling an emptiness inside me and knowing that I would never see my parents again. But my faith was stronger than my emotions, and I persisted in the hope that there would someday be a reunion of all of us. After all these years in prison, we found ourselves unable to believe one word the Russians were saying. Our only hope that America and the free world would ask for release of all prisoners of war gave us the courage to remain alive. The end of the war, in May 1945, was a relief for all people on earth. The Russians devoted eight days to celebrating their victory over Nazi Germany. We prisoners thanked the Lord that we were alive, skeletons though we were, hoping still for the chance to return some day and build a new life. Would this be soon, we wondered, or how much longer would we have to stay? Could we carry on much longer under these terrible circumstances? Several months after the end of the war, the Russians brought trainload after trainload of furniture, food, clothing and equipment from Germany. They called this action reparations. We saw Russian women dressed in the uniforms of Nazi officers, the stars and medals still on, obviously enjoying what they considered an attractive style. We found the spectacle ludicrous. As we marched our daily route to work, we found that the train station was loaded with all the furniture from Germany, now the property of the state, which made no effort to divide it among the people, leaving it at the mercy of the elements. 
The Russian officials declared that we were no longer prisoners of war, giving us instead the title of reparation workmen. There did not seem to be a great deal of difference. We lost all hope for our return to Germany. Nobody in the world could enforce our return. Most of the prisoners had died, no records kept of their passing, and now we were reparation workmen. The free world could only conjecture as to how many men had been captured and how many remained alive. At Christmas, 1945, each one of us was permitted to send a postcard home. It was a propaganda move only, designed to show that Russia made no secret of its captured soldiers. We tried to contact our relatives, but nobody knew where they were living now. I wrote every month to my parents, but never received an answer, nor was my card returned. Few among us had made contact with our families, and most had abandoned hope of a reunion. Somehow I could not relinquish the hope. Perhaps I will find them when I get back. I comforted myself. But when will it be? One year had passed since the end of the war, and our lives had not changed for the better. In August 1946, there was great excitement in camp. Russia had decided to send home the first prisoners. We wondered who would be among them, the sick, the dystrophic, the older men. It was a question for which we found no answer. Nobody had any idea as to how the selection was to be made, but every one of us had hopes of being chosen. The list, when it was made public, sealed our disappointment, for only fifty men were being sent home, and those fifty were so ill as to be nearly dead. However, the mere fact that any were being sent was reassuring. Surely Russia had to release more of us. Then the free world and the government of Germany would learn about the numerous prisoners still alive in Russia and would claim their return. Unbreakable faith in the humanity of the free world gave us the strength to carry on and the willpower to live. Soon after this, another transport was planned, and I was among the 300 men selected. We were issued new clothes and fed well for almost 14 days, happily waiting for the time to come when we would march to the train station. It seemed certain that the new clothes had been given us to make a good impression on our return to freedom, but after six days of riding in the train, we stopped at Zelenodolsk on the River Volga, our destination. The guard told us that we had to do reparation work for at least two more years. It seemed the final blow to our spirits, which now lapsed to a point of hopeless acceptance of the inevitable. From now on we were on our own. The cost of our living was set at 500 rubles a month for each of us, and we had to work very hard to meet our expenses, since there were some 50 men working inside the camp whom we were compelled to support. We alternated between two factories, one a paper mill, and the other a wartime ammunition plant which was now producing aluminum. Our daily fixed quota was so extremely high that we could never fulfil it. I worked for some time in the paper mill, then inside the camp and in the wintertime on the River Volga, which was the hardest job. We had to break open the ice upon the river and fish out the logs which were floated in the summer, but which were now frozen, pulling them out with long chains. Cold and wet, our clothes frozen to our bodies, we had to work doubly hard in order to keep warm. Many of us suffered frostbitten noses and ears, our hands and feet numbed by the intense cold. While I was working in the paper mill, I made friends with some Russian civilians, asking them about their way of life and how they felt about the Communist Party. They would talk to me only when we were alone, fearing to be overheard by the Communists. I discovered that the Russian people were waiting for something to free them, but it would have to come from outside. I consider this to be true even today, regardless of the statements coming out of Russia. State-owned cooperatives, kolkhozes, are not satisfying the people. The Politburo has trained the people to work as industriously as if each individual was an owner, but personal interest in one's work is entirely lacking. The rule is, he who is not working shall not eat. Therefore, every human being must work regardless of what kind of work he does. The same applies to family life. Children of a certain age have to join the youth movement and are taken away from their parents, to be trained in the communistic ideology and in the profession which seems most vital to the welfare of the nation. A citizen who makes the mistakes of talking against the communists 
is tried before a political justice as a criminal against the security of the state and sentenced to hard labour far away from home, his partner in marriage deported in the opposite direction. There is no opportunity for such a family to be reunited, and the marriage is therefore annulled. Such is life under communism. I was born and raised in a good Christian family, where I learned about capitalism, democracy, and national socialism, and now, in Russia, I was living under the communist system. I went through this paradise for labourers with open eyes, but I was unable to find one respect in which the system was not repugnant to freedom-loving people. Nobody owned private property. Even radios were to be found only in the office of the political instructor, who listened only to what he was permitted to hear. In the apartments were loudspeakers, through which the occupants could listen only to what the instructor had tuned in. Cars and all other practical equipment were the property of the state. People in certain positions were permitted to make use of these cars, but nobody owned them. Who takes care of something that is not his own? Farms and vital factories are the property of the state, all such institutions compelled to produce a quota which is fixed by the Department of Agriculture. The supervisors of these farms and factories are communists, who shift the workers at will to the places where they are most needed. If all the farms in one state produce only wheat, and all the farms in another state grow only potatoes, they still cannot exchange their product without permission from the authorities. One incident which astonished me is indicative of the manner in which these people are treated. We were working on a new road and couldn't fulfil our quota by a fixed date. One day before this date, there appeared a truck filled with cleanly dressed women from the next town to lay the asphalt on the new road. I asked several women, Why do you come here to work with asphalt in your good clothes? The answer was shocking to me. The women had been in town waiting in line for their groceries when the police came and picked up all women on the street and brought them here to work. Their responsibilities as wives and mothers were of no concern to anybody. What was important was that the street be finished on time. Such incidents made me more determined than ever to keep alive the hope of returning to my own country, though when it would be was a question we could not answer. I had to work in turns in the paper mill, in the aluminum factory and on the Volga. We could thank the Lord for the fact that the time goes quickly, even during periods when it seems that the food shortage will kill you. For two years we worked as hard as our physical constitutions would permit, never once reaching the prescribed quota. In mid-1947, about 50 men, those with some injuries and frostbitten limbs, were selected to be transported home. We were happy for them, because their lives were in danger under the conditions prevailing in Russia. But whether they reached their native country, nobody knows. After their departure, only 250 men remained in camp. We did not know what fate had in store for us, though all of us hoped to be released some day. Near the end of 1947, there was much excitement in camp when somebody learned that our camp would be abandoned soon because we could not meet our expenses. We did believe that we would be repatriated now, but it proved to be only a rumour. Week after week passed with no break in our routine. One day in November, we were not made to go to work. The fence was locked and we were assembled to hear the news from the camp officer, who told us that we could not make as much money as was needed and that therefore this camp would be closed down within a week. He did not tell us what our own fate was to be, but we were issued clean uniforms, boots and coats which came from the Russian army, and fed well for almost fourteen days, which we took as a sure sign of impending repatriation. On the last day we marched smiling to the train station, entered the coach and made ourselves as comfortable as possible, closing the doors and starting a fire in the stoves which were in the middle of each car. Late at night, when the train started to pull out, we were tired from excitement, and every one of us fell asleep. While we could not keep track of the direction in which we were heading, we did not doubt that we were going home. After the fourth day, we planned to watch for the names of towns we were passing through, placing one man at a very small window. In the morning of the sixth day, he turned from the window, frightened, to tell that we were heading east and right now were crossing the European-Asian border. We could not believe him. 
rushing to the window to see for ourselves. It was true, we were going east. Where would be our destination? We asked ourselves. Were we to be made to endure another period of hardship? Lord help us, we thought. Disappointed from many years of captivity, undernourished and ill, it did not seem possible that we could endure further deprivation of a normal life. Five years had passed since I was captured, with no word from my parents and no sign of release. My will to live very nearly left me. My faith and hope wavered as I asked myself whether I could any longer believe in God. My spirit was assailed with doubt, but after a night of silent prayers I was filled with renewed faith. I had to be patient and to believe. I was still alive, and the chance of being released was always present. I strove to fight down my doubts, though I often wondered whether it would not be better if I were dead, for who knew what I would find when I returned to my country, whether I would find my relatives and under what conditions. Several more days passed before we could see where we were landing, Karpinsk, south of Sverdlovsk in the Ural Mountains. This would be our place to live or to die. The camp itself was bigger than any we had ever seen before. We wondered how many prisoners were here and whether we would have a chance to be released soon. The more prisoners who were waiting for their return, the smaller our chances would be. To our surprise, we found about 1,800 men at camp and our coming brought the total to about 2,000. As soon as we entered Camp Karpinsk, we had to pass all the usual examination and registration. It was a full day before we were divided and placed to our brigades. I found myself in a brigade selected to work in the quarry. It was our job to move the railroad tracks. Every morning when we came to work, a Russian foreman was there handing out shovels, pickaxes, jimmies and jacks. Then he gave his instructions to the leader of our brigade. He blew a whistle, at which signal we took up our tools and started our march to the place where we would work, two miles or more from the tool room. We began work immediately upon arrival, levelling the ground for the new tracks, removing the old tracks from their ties, carrying the tracks on our shoulders as far as 100 feet, while others dug out the ties preparatory to moving them to the new location. The ties were of oak, weighing up to 200 pounds, and each tie was carried by two men. Another group had to place the ties, lay and nail down the tracks, level the tracks, and tighten the ties. It was very hard work, especially in winter. We never came close to fulfilling our quota. We had to work in temperature of 35 degrees below zero, and in a section of country which has almost five months of winter. The clothing was entirely inadequate. Many times, when our clothes were wet, we had to dry them inside the barracks. Boots and gloves were of different sizes, and we were forced to exchange them among ourselves in order to achieve a proper fit. Somehow we got through 9048, though we did not count days, months or years any more. Every morning was a new day, and as long as we were alive, we hoped for something unexpected, for some help from the free world. Perhaps America and the Western powers would claim our release, we thought. We knew that the Russians did not care about the opinions of the free world, but it was our only hope. The Russians kept every move a secret, so that no one knew what was going on. They spread some rumours to keep us going, hoping, working. In the spring of 1949, another group was selected to be repatriated. This time only those who would go to East Germany and work there were chosen. Since I had been born in East Prussia, I was on the list to go home. As soon as I entered the ambulance for physical examination, the officer of the state police whispered to the doctor that he believed I was one of Hitler's SS men, judging by my height and looks. I did not pass the examination and was forced to return to work. I was bitterly disappointed, having been so near to release, but after a few days I was myself again, hoping for better luck next time. The very same thing happened three times more, and when I was again summoned for the release examination in October 1949, I had little hope that I would be chosen. This time, however, my luck seemed to hold. Another police officer was on duty and gave his OK for my release. The date for our repatriation was set for November 3, 1949. Excitement was great, for this transport was the fifth to be released, and the departure of this group would leave only 500 men at Karpinsk. 
We received new uniforms while waiting for the deadline. The train had been delayed by the deep snow, and as day after day passed with no word of it, we began to believe that our repatriation was another false alarm. Three more days dragged by in fear, hope and sorrow, each day seeming to be an eternity. Finally, on November 6, the train arrived and we breathed freely again. Praise the Lord, we thought, we are finally going home. As soon as the news was out, we dressed at once and went to the fence. Once more, we had to stay in line and wait until our names were called to leave the camp. Outside the fence, we had to form groups and wait until the last one had left the camp. One of the Russian officers gave the order, and we marched in silence to the train station, our minds occupied with the future. Each man's face mirrored his emotion. Some were praying, some smiling happily, some fearful, as they wondered what they would find at home. Home, I could not go home, because my hometown was in Russian territory. Where shall I go to look for my relatives, I wondered. But my happiness at leaving this hell on earth was sufficient for the time being and I knew I would find the strength to look around when I got there. After an hour's march we came to the train station. Surprisingly, our train was there and waiting. We were counted again, the officer in charge calling the name of each one who was permitted to enter the wagon. This procedure took almost the entire day. Late at night the train pulled out, and we knew we were going home at last. Joy and happiness filled our hearts for the first time in seven years, Forgotten were the hardships, fear and hunger. Thankful for survival, everyone prayed silently and fell asleep smiling happily. When we awoke next morning, we found that the train was still rolling. This was a surprise, for usually when we rode a train they stopped at night. Our first stop was at noon, at which time they gave us our meal. The soup tasted delicious to us in this cold weather for we were going home. Besides the soup we were given some bread. As soon as we had finished eating, the engineer blew the whistle and the train began to roll again. We spent twelve days on the train before reaching the Russian-Polish border, where the doors were locked and the guards took turns watching the train and the prisoners. We did not know the reason. Some law, we supposed. Next morning, we stopped at Brest-Litovsk and had to leave our train, for the Polish government took over our transport through Poland. At Brest-Litovsk, which is the transit station, the tracks are of a different width. Therefore, the Russian trains cannot pass through Polish country. After we had left the train, we saw that we were in some kind of camp again. In this camp, one of our number called for a meeting, at which he read a resolution drawn up by the Antifa. It was a thank you note to Russia for the opportunity to work for Russia and for having been liberated from the Nazi regime for being still alive and able to work in the future for the interests of the Communist Party. Everyone was asked to sign this resolution. I could not and would not sign, discovering later that only a few had signed this statement. After this meeting, the Polish government took charge of the whole affair, reading each prisoner's name, which was then repeated by the prisoner, along with his surname and date of birth, before he could enter the train on the opposite track. After several hours, when the examination was finished, about twenty-five men still remained outside. We did not know what had happened to them, but later we heard that they were wanted for some reason by the Polish government. Our nerves were on edge, tension and fear mixed with our hope. How long, we wondered, would it be till we were free? Hysterical laughter, jokes and some talk about food could be heard among the crowd, in the eyes of most could be seen fear for the future. Many of us sat silently in a corner, praying for strength. The strain on men who had been so long in prison was almost unbearable. The train headed west, destination Frankfurt on the Oder, through the formerly German territory of East Prussia and the Corridor, through towns which had once been German territory, now occupied by Poland. What we saw in this part of the country was shocking, Towns and villages abandoned, no signs of life at all, weed-grown streets, houses destroyed by war or exposed to the mercy of the elements and the ravages of decay. Some towns, heavily populated before the war, were now occupied by the Polish, with only a few Germans among them. 
A few of the remaining Germans came to the train station to beg for bread. We did not have much food for ourselves, but we gave them all we had left. They told us their war experiences and begged us to take them with us. We could not do a thing to help them. In my mind, I visualized my parents in the same situation. I could think of nothing more terrible in life than to find my parents begging for bread. My fear grew within me as I wondered where I should look for my parents and sister. Perhaps they had had the chance to flee East Prussia and save their lives. It was the only hope I had. The ride through this familiar part of my country was as endless as the worries and fear that beset my heart. On the night of November 20, we arrived at Frankfurt on the Oder. As soon as we left the train, we were divided into two groups. Those who were going to the East Zone could board a train the same night, but those going to West Germany had to spend the night in the waiting room and take the train the next morning. At 4am, the train pulled out of Frankfurt in the direction of Helmstedt, the end station of East Germany. Arriving about 10 a.m., across from Helmstedt is Friedland, the door to freedom, and the fulfilment of our hopes and dreams. On the other side, some 200 yards away, we could see the Red Cross wagon, the American officers, the Salvation Army building, and the buses. Marching in groups of five, we passed the Russian guard at the border, showed our discharge papers, and then were free. As soon as we passed the guard, we knelt to touch the ground. The American officers and Red Cross workers gave us a hospitable welcome. Buses carried us to the transit camp in Friedland, where we had our first decent bath and were given new underwear, food and a bed. In the meantime, we were registered and subjected to physical examination. I could not rest until I knew something about my relatives. I was looking for the Red Cross office, finding it in the main building, a well-equipped office with photos and addresses of people who were expecting somebody back from prison camp or from East Germany. I went to the window for refugees from East Prussia and gave my name, asking for my parents and sister. The lady on duty went through book after book to find the names I had given her. I was shaking, the sweat running down my face, my heart beat so loud I was sure everyone could hear it. I could not believe what the lady was telling me, having to ask her again and again but it had the ring of truth, and I stood helplessly while her words bored into my very soul. My father had passed away in November, 1944. My mother had been shot down by Russian soldiers in 1945. My sister and both of her children had been displaced to Siberia, and died of starvation in 1946. Anise had been repatriated in April, 1949. Everything broke down inside me. All my hope, the strength to which I had clung in the past seven years, left me with this terrible news. I was a stranger in West Germany, with no friends, no relatives and no home. I tried to pull myself together, wondering what to do first. In Friedland I received 40 marks, enough to rent a room. I found a furnished room, paying 12 and half marks a week in advance, which left me sufficient money for food. In the weeks to come, I was unable to work and received unemployment compensation of 17 and half marks a week, but the room rent took most of the money. For three months, I was under a doctor's care, taking calcium shots three times a week and without the money to eat properly. I decided to go on my own and look for a position, but I found little sympathy for a homeless refugee. As a repatriated former soldier, I had to work for less money than others. I was glad to earn an honest living. As soon as I had become adjusted to normal living, I tried to find my niece. The Red Cross helped me to locate her. Though she was living far from me, I nevertheless took several days off from my work to see her, for I wanted to know the terrible truth about my mother's death. When I went to her apartment, her landlady told me that she was working and would not be back until afternoon. It was still early in the day, but I went to the train station and waited until she came. As train after train arrived without her, I became more nervous by the minute, my heart beating heavily and my palms damp with perspiration. Finally, I saw her leave the train, and I moved back a few steps to let her pass the ticket window. When she was beside me, I called her name. She looked at me and fell, crying into my arms. I tried to calm her, but I was more nervous than she. 
With my last pennies, we went into the nearest coffee house where we would be undisturbed. She told me about the death of my father and the terrible death of my mother. She went on and on, telling me all her experiences during the time when the Russian soldiers had opened fire on my hometown. Her impressions seemed badly garbled, for she had so much to tell and could not keep the story straight. I could see that her mind was too full of all those terrible incidents to tell the story in chronological order. I had to piece it together from what she could tell me. When the Russian army invaded our hometown, the younger people fled out of town, but the older ones stayed there in the basements and air raid shelter, where they were safer than being on the road. My mother, she told me, tried to walk out of town after staying in the basement for some time. My mother was then almost seventy years of age and couldn't walk very fast. Nevertheless, she walked about eight miles into a small village where she was shot in the forehead by a Russian soldier. Nobody had the time or the courage to bury the dead, though some friends of ours brought back my mother's purse and kept it until my sister returned to town with her children, after fourteen days of wandering from farmer to farmer, begging for food and shelter. On her return to our town, she found her house and our parents' house burned to the ground. Only a few survivors remained, and their ordeal was just beginning. My niece told me how my sister had to work for the Russian soldiers to get food for the children. Hunger destroys human values. Some of the people in our town turned communist as soon as the Russian army entered the town, trying to be friendly with the soldiers. My family and the family of my sister were considered among the upper ten thousand, for we had four houses of our own, and my sister's husband was a jeweller and optician. My father's business was only a few blocks away, and our family was well known in the town. Those who sought to collaborate with the communists told the Russian soldiers that my sister had diamonds and gold in her possession. The Russian state police took my sister and her children into custody, questioning her about the jewellery, finally beating her and confining her in prison. She and the children were displaced to Siberia, where my sister died of starvation after six months. My niece was kept in prison until 1949. I promised my niece that I would take care of her, for I was the only male survivor of the family. Back on my job, my mind occupied with all these terrible experiences in our family. I found it difficult to work, homeless, without friends, a stranger uprooted in West Germany. What future was there for me here? Perhaps I could start a new life in the United States. I determined to try. I went to the American Consulate and made my application to enter the United States as a refugee. I had to wait six years until my dream came true, six long years that seemed an eternity. But now I am living in a free world, free of fear and anxiety, free of the past and looking forward toward a better and happy future. With all my heart and soul, I can say, God bless America.